Allora, se ci siamo tutti possiamo partire. Io farò solo una piccola introduzione come, come parte del, del luogo ospitante. Ci fa molto piacere ospitare questa presentazione all'interno delle presentazioni mensili che facciamo come biblioteca di Accademia del Caffè Espresso, quindi cercando di creare un ponte fra il nostro centro culturale e il tessuto, il tessuto di Firenze, quindi cercare di rendere questo posto ancora più di, dinamico, usando la cultura, che sembra una cosa molto difficile e strana in questo periodo, invece non lo è, e ci fa molto piacere oggi ospitare, in realtà mi veniva da dire il primo la prima presentazione internazionale, ma con uno dei, dei, dei romanzi più iconici e italiani che, che esistono al mondo. E, eh, ci faceva molto piacere appunto eh, avere questo, parlare di questo romanzo che per tanti versi è diventato uno stereotipo e quindi riscoprirlo con occhi nuovi e con curiosità. Quindi ringrazio Anna Cracina che ci ha proposto questa presentazione, John Hooper, che ehm, ci racconteranno un po' il loro percorso e ci faranno vedere un nuovo punto di vista su Pinocchio. Grazie mille. Grazie mille. Grazie. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. You may be wondering why a journalist and an academic should be interested in a children's story. The reason why we're here to talk about Pinocchio is that, as you've already heard, John and I teamed up to do a new and extensively annotated translation of the original Pinocchio book, which was published in September 2021 by Penguin Classics. The point is that The Adventures of Pinocchio is not just kid stuff. Yes, it was written for children, and in fact, it was published in installments in Il Giornale per i Bambini, which is the newspaper for children, between 1881 and 1883 by Carlo Collodi, whose real name was Carlo Lorenzini. So clearly, it was written for children, but not only for them. This is a book that's rich in subtle illusions and artful devices comparable to Alice in Wonderland that way are to Gulliver's Travels. It's a story with many layers of meaning. Some of you have almost certainly been conditioned by this. Disney's 1940 cartoon movie is about a cute little chap who tells the odd fib. He's brought to life in some unspecified alpine-looking country where his creator, Geppetto, speaks with an Eastern European accent, not an Italian one. But then it was 1940, remember, and Mussolini's Italy had just gone to war against the United States' European allies, so Italy was not exactly popular in Hollywood. First of all, as you probably all know, the original book is not set in the Alps. The action takes place right here in Tuscany. And Pinocchio is not a sweet, cute little guy. He's actually a real brat. Certainly he's good-hearted, which is stated over and over again in the tale, but he's no angel. This, in fact, is how he was first depicted by Enrico Mazzanti when the book first came out. I mean, that's a badass teenager, right? That's a kid with attitude. If you were looking for a modern day reincarnation of Pinocchio, you might opt for, well, Bart Simpson. But this guy is really up to no good. You could imagine him in ripped jeans and a hoodie, you know, out looking for trouble. The gap between the way the Pinocchio story is viewed by many people in Italy and the view taken of it by speakers of English is immense. In fact, for Italians, The Adventures of Pinocchio is a masterpiece. It's considered one of the greatest works in our literary canon, and it's a constant source of inspiration for artists of all kind. 
This, for example, is a poster for an exhibition in Florence not so long ago of the paintings, sculptures, and other works of Pinocchio by world-renowned artists such as Giacometti, Calder, and many more. All of a sudden, Pinocchio is in vogue. Around about the time of that exhibition, one of Italy's leading movie directors, Matteo Garrone, released his version of Pinocchio, which is altogether more faithful to the original book than Disney's version. That film has been playing in art houses in the United States, um, and last year, no less than three new Pinocchio movies came out. A Russian cartoon film dubbed into English, a Disney live action remake of its 1940 cartoon starring Tom Hanks that was universally damned by the critics. And in December, Guillermo del Toro, who won two Oscars with The Shape of Water, released a stop motion animated version of Pinocchio that has won fulsome praise from the critics and has brought him a third Oscar for best animated feature. From December last year to April this year, there was an exhibition at the MoMA in New York City on the craft and process behind Guillermo del Toro's film, which is now moving to the west coast of the United States. So I think we can agree that the Pinocchio story has clearly struck a chord with a lot of creative people. Why? Maybe it has something to do with the fact that we're in an age of fake news, alternative facts, and virtual reality in which issues of truth and lies have become all important. Or maybe the story has echoes of AI or artificial intelligence. Pinocchio is, after all, a kind of robot but with an independent intelligence, a very independent intelligence of the kind that AI is already developing today. At all events, it's a good moment to reflect on the original book. Carlo Collodi's The Adventures of Pinocchio is a story told with a brilliant use of a language. Italian scholars have written books and books on the adventures and its cultural, social, political, and even religious significance. So let's begin at the beginning of chapter one. Once upon a time. Wait, wait, hold it, hold it right there. Although it certainly doesn't seem like it, the use of the formula once upon a time proves the point we were making earlier. By opening his story in this apparently traditional way, Carlo Collodi is sending a message as paradoxical as it may seem, he's telling us that the story is not, in fact, just for children. But how do we know that? Well, Carlo Collodi was also a satirical journalist, and C'era una volta, the equivalent of Once Upon a Time, of course, was a sort of in-joke among the satirists of his circle. It was a phrase he and they had often used to start articles that were apparently fairy tales, but which were actually social, are political satires. Collodi himself was quoted in the journal La Lente in 1856 as having said, I quote, hey, have you mistaken us for a bunch of kids with that once upon a time? No, no, hold on. I'm not telling you a fairy tale as would seem to be the case, but instead I'm recounting a historical fact, end of quote. So clearly, with his Once Upon a Time, Collodi is sending a message that this is serious stuff. And against this background, it's actually no surprise that The Adventures is a great work of literature. Most importantly, it touches on themes that are universal and that are of the essence in every time and place. In addition to that, it's a book that we Italians feel a very strong connection to, maybe because it is so revealing about us. In fact, the true original Pinocchio story reflects many of the Italians' enduring national characteristics again and again. It's certainly an endless source of metaphors that are used all the time in Italian life. But back to the beginning of the story. 
this time for real. The story opens with a Tuscan carpenter, Mr. Cherry, who's astonished to hear a voice coming from inside a lump of wood. He gives the lump of wood to his friend, Geppetto, who's a wood carver. And Geppetto brings Pinocchio to life, but not before the two men have a big falling out. In fact, they come to blows. But then Collodi writes, and I quote, they shook hands and swore they would remain friends to the end of their lives, end of quote. This depicts, we think, a very Italian trait, the ability of Italians to forgive and forget even quite serious disagreements. And this same episode where we see Mr. Cherry and Geppetto clashing brings to light another very Italian characteristic. During the fight, the two little old men rip off each other's wigs. Now, if we consider that this story was written in the 1880s and that by the 1880s, nobody or almost nobody was wearing a wig any longer in Italy, it's clear that Collodi is making the two men into figures of fun. Geppetto and his friend are putting on airs and graces and pretending to be gentlemen. On one hand, of course, that makes them even more ridiculous, but on the other, it shows the importance of keeping up appearances in all senses of the word, even among the poor. So what Collodi is giving us is a reference to that most, of Ita most uh, Italian of concepts, bella figura. Making a good impression on others. Bella figura, as suggested here by Collodi, is constantly present in Italian life. But back to Pinocchio. He comes to life, and immediately he starts misbehaving. He gets his father sent to jail. He kills the talking cricket. He sells his spelling book to go to see a puppet show. And after a series of events, he ends up on the wrong side of the fearsome puppeteer, Mangiafuoco, fire eater. He even risks being killed by this terrifying monster of a human being. But then Mangiafuoco has a change of heart and ends up giving Pinocchio five gold coins to take to his father. So Mangiafuoco is actually not the terrible man he pretends to be. And that points to something that everyone comes across in Italy, which is theatricality, people acting out apart. Italy is a country, a society, in which theater is really a part of life, and you do well to bear in mind that not everything that is threatened is really meant. But how does Pinocchio actually bring about Fire Eater's abrupt change of heart? The puppet deploys flattery, but flattery of a very specific kind. He addresses Fire Eater using titles that grow in splendor and importance as he desperately tries to win him over. This is how it goes. Have pity, Mr. Fire Eater, said Pinocchio. There are no misters here, replied the puppet dear sternly. Have pity, Mr. Knight. There are no knights here. Have pity, Mr. Lord. There are no lords here. Have pity, Your Excellency. And finally, it works. Again, I quote, hearing himself called Excellency, the puppeteer immediately pursed his lips tight and having suddenly become more humane and approachable, he said to Pinocchio, so then, what do you want from me? Titles are important in Italy and it's important to use the right one. Something else this episode brings out, we think, is Italians' essential soft-heartedness. In Italy, rules can be bent, and forgiveness is ubiquitous. So Pinocchio sets off with his gold coins, and before he can take them to Geppetto, he runs into two of the most famous characters in the story, Il Gatto e la Volpe, the cat and the fox, two villains who represent that untranslatable concept, furbizia, which is omnipresent in Italian life. If you look in an Italian English dictionary, all the definitions are negative. You find cunning, sly, deceitful. 
Those words all cover the meaning to some extent, but in Italian, the concept is not always completely negative. There is a world of difference, for example, between fare il furbo, which is negative and means taking an unfair advantage, like jumping the queue, and essere furbo, which means knowing how to get your way in life, and which almost always attracts at least a tad of admiration. At one point, Pinocchio is seized by a farmer and made to work as a watchdog. He's chained up and laments his plight, but then, in a very Italian way, he resigns himself to his fate and uses a phrase you will hear over and over again in Italy, ci vuole pazienza, literally, patience is needed. This sense of fatalism is woven into Italian's DNA. Many have speculated that this is because of their history. From the end of the Roman Empire in 476 to Italy's unification in 1861, so for 14 centuries, Italians were all too often subjugated to the will of foreign rulers. This lack of control over their own destiny may explain the fatalism. Italians lack of control over their own destiny also perhaps explains furbizia as an essential tool for survival. The farmer's previous watchdog called Melampo has just died. Melampo's job was to protect the farmer's chickens from the local weasels, the faine. But Pinocchio discovers that Melampo was actually in cahoots with the weasels. He'd turn a blind eye every time they broke into the chicken coop, and in return for his acquiescence in their nefarious exploits, they gave him a neatly plucked chicken for every eight that they stole. It is what in English would be called a 12.5% kickback. And what an Italian is called a tangente. But, and this is a key point, I can remember from my childhood in the Tuscan countryside how dogs like Melampo were treated by the farmers. They never had enough to eat. They were skin and bones, and they spent their whole lives on a chain like poor old Melampo. So perhaps Collodi here is making a point that the origin of much furubizia is tied to deprivation. Yes. And that leads us to another one of the themes that runs through this book, which is injustice. And that includes social injustice. This is a fairy tale with no princes or princesses, a fairy tale in which there are no knights in shining armor and no damsels in distress. Collodi's characters are all victims of grinding poverty. What's more, they live their lives at the mercy of a legal system which is unjust and unpredictable. For example, in both the episodes in which the Carabinieri feature, they do the wrong thing and they arrest the wrong person. The police, the Carabinieri, are depicted by Collodi as being both not so smart and unjust. They're bad guys. In what fairy tale in any other country are the police bad guys? This speaks volumes about Italians' enduring cynicism about the forces of law and order and about authority in general. The puppet is constantly in and out of trouble. He even ends up in court because the cat and the fox have stolen his money. But what happens? The judge who, by the way, is an ape, sends Pinocchio to jail instead. And why? As a punishment for being gullible. So here is a story written for children in which the message is don't expect justice from the institutions. And if you're gullible, you're going to pay for it. Pinocchio eventually gets out of jail, but only thanks to an amnesty. Again, Collodi is confronting us with the recurring practice in Italy. Amnesties of various kinds were and still are an enduring feature of Italian life. 
When I researched my book, The Italians, I found that there had been roughly one amnesty every four years since the 1950s. But Pinocchio's problem is that he actually has not broken the law. So the amnesty doesn't apply to him. And it's only after he protests in the politest possible way that he's released. What he says is, Domando scusa, ma sono malandrino anch'io. In other words, I do beg your pardon, but I too am a crook. And then he's set free. Amnesties for criminals are not the only kind in Italy, as you know. There are frequently amnesties for those who haven't paid their taxes, one of which was passed this year, those who haven't paid fines of one kind or another, and those who've broken the planning or zoning regulations. It's also the reason why Italy is smothered with buildings and extensions that were never approved by any local authority. But going back to Furbizia, the cat and the fox's Furbizia is anything but admirable. Though Collodi Rigi calls them, they embody all that is evil about Furbizia. They set their minds on stealing Pinocchio's gold coins, as we have seen, and they convince the gullible puppet that if he plants his coins in the field of miracles, there will grow a tree that will yield lots more gold coins. But instead of taking him to the field or just robbing him straight away, they take him to an inn, the Gambero Rosso. That, of course, is why Italy's foremost food and drink magazine is called Gambero Rosso. And the same is true of its most famous gastronomic guide. And what's more, dozens, scores of restaurants around Italy are called Il Gambero Rosso. As always in Italy, Food is of the essence. Now, the cat and the fox have decided they're going to rob poor Pinocchio. So, again, the question is, why don't they just get on with it? Why did they bring him to the Gambero Rosso at all? Our theory is that they regard stealing his coins as a kind of business transaction. And an Italy business goes more smoothly if the party's involved share a meal. But not everything goes smoothly in the adventures. Pinocchio escapes being robbed, but is chased through the woods in the dark by El Gatto La Volpe, who end up hanging him from a tree. And that is how the story was meant to end. This was the end of the run of installments first published in the children's newspaper. It was only after an outcry from Collodi's young readers, that he was persuaded to continue what eventually became the book. So, have any of you noticed that something is missing from that original story? So far, there has been no mention at all of Pinocchio's nose growing when he tells a lie. So had the story ended here at the first run of installments, there would be no Pinocchio emoji for a fib, no Pinocchios given out by the fact checkers at the Washington Post, no Pinocchio hand gesture, and maybe no Pinocchio at all. And we wouldn't all be here. When Collodi resumes his tale, Pinocchio is rescued and taken to a house belonging to a blue-haired fairy, where he falls ill. He refuses to take his medicine, and once again, he's expected to die. But then we come to some black humor. Undertakers, Pecchini, turn up to take away his body once he's dead. But the undertakers are rabbits, the most inoffensive creatures on earth, black rabbits. But that's not just Collodi being funny. Any Florentine over a certain age will see the connection with an organization that most of you will know about because it's written on the sides of ambulances in and around Florence, Misericordia. The Misericordia claims to be the world's oldest NGO. It was founded in 1244 
And one of the tasks its volunteers undertook was to carry away the dead, especially in times of plague. But the thing is this, in their long black gowns and hoods, they look like nothing so much as giant black rabbits. The members of the Misericordia stopped wearing their distinctive garb in the streets not so long ago. They still wear it during their private ceremonies, as you can see in this picture that was taken not so long ago. I remember them when they would still go out in the streets dressed like that. They used to scare the wits out of me when I was a little girl, and even as a teenager, they really made me feel uncomfortable. It is only in the second part of the book, in the 17th chapter, in fact, that finally Pinocchio's nose grows for the first time because he tells a lie. So if Collodi didn't intend his book to be about lying, which is what everyone thinks, what did he intend it to be about? Up till now, we've been talking about what this book tells us about Italy. But The Adventures of Pinocchio is also a work of literature that reflects universal things. In fact, a theme that appears again and again through the book, and we believe the most important of all, is one that has a special relevance to us all. What we are looking at here is the importance of education. The whole plot revolves around Pinocchio either going or not going to school, which is when he gets into all sorts of trouble. And the biggest trouble of all is waiting for him near the end of the book. Pinocchio has a friend called Luciniolo Lampwick, who persuades the puppet to skip school and go with him to a wonderful place that he has been told about where the children don't have to study. On the contrary, they spend all day, every day, playing to their heart's content. This is the Paese dei Balocchi, Playland. But Playland is a dangerous place. In fact, one fine day, Pinocchio and Lampwick wake up with donkey ears, and gradually they turn into real donkeys and they begin to bray. They become unable to talk which in itself is significant. Just think about it. If you're a donkey, you can't communicate with anyone except other donkeys. In any case, they're sold off at a local market. Reading that passage, we were struck by how it relates to politics and not least to Italian politics. It's no coincidence that Guillermo del Toro's movie is set in Italy in the days of its fascist dictatorship. It's a well-known concept that the less educated people are, the easier it is for politicians to deceive and to control them. It may also be no coincidence that in Italy, politicians have been cutting government spending on education since the turn of the century. By 2019, which rather amazingly is the last year for which comparative figures are available, government spending on education in Italy had dropped to 3.8% of GDP. That was the third lowest figure in the European Union. Not so long ago, an Italian education minister actually resigned because of the cabinet's refusal to increase spending on education. Playland is a good metaphor for other things too. One way of looking at Italian politics since the turn of the century is a constant search for the avoidance of hard choices. And not just in Italy. Again and again in recent years, politicians have got themselves elected in Britain, in the United States, and elsewhere by promising a trip to Playland, by telling voters that they can get away without making painful sacrifices. Now, we don't think that Carlo Collodi, writing in the 1880s, was aware of any of that. But we do think that Playland delivers a warning against a mindset, an outlook that Collodi deplored in many of his journalistic commentaries. What's more, 
It's a warning that's particularly relevant to our populist times. Pinocchio narrowly escapes being slaughtered for his hide, but his friend Lampwick is worked to death. The fate that in a less dramatic form awaited many unskilled laborers in Collodi's day. In Italian, the word for donkey is applied both to those who are worked to the point of exhaustion are indeed death, and to those who don't do well at school. And this is not necessarily because they are stupid, but because they refuse to study. Collodi's point from the beginning of the book is that being a donkey at school leads to being exploited or deceived and working like a donkey afterwards. The only way to avoid living the life and maybe dying the death of a donkey is to get an education. And that is what Pinocchio finally does. As we've argued in an article that we wrote for the New York Times and in the notes of our translation, education is fundamental to the adventure's fairy tale ending in which Pinocchio ceases to be a puppet and becomes finally a real boy. But as we also wrote, his miraculous trans transformation requires a further crucial element. It's only when he starts to take responsibility for himself and for those that he loves that he earns the right to become a human being. The moral of the story then is not that children should always tell the truth. It is not mainly a book about lying, which is what so many people believe. In fact, there are several occasions in which in the adventures in which Pinocchio tells a lie and his nose does not grow. The moral of the story is that education brings with it self-awareness and a sense of duty to others. So we would argue that the true message of the adventures of Pinocchio is that until you open yourself to knowledge and to your fellow human beings, you will remain a puppet forever. Other people will continue to pull your strings. And what in these increasingly authoritarian times, ladies and gentlemen, could be more ardently relevant than that? Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for being such a great audience. Does anybody have any questions? Shall I take the second part first? Okay. Yeah. Con difficulta. <laughs> um, it was a very good partnership because um, Anna's dominant language is Italian. My dominant language is English, but we both speak the other language. And we had contrasting approaches, which is why we had so many arguments while we were doing the book, um, which is that Anna was as an academic, all for the um, faithfulness to the original. So she wanted to bring out the beauty of the words that Collodi had used, the meaning, often a very subtle meaning, um, which was difficult to translate into English. Um, and I was pushing, as a journalist, for readability. So um, we would have 
constant clashes, but we actually normally found a way through. And only in a few, four or five places in the book where we really couldn't agree on how to do it were we forced to put it to arbitration uh, of um, a bilingual professor at the uh, university in New York whom we consulted. Um, so the first part of your question, the, the language of Collodi, it's beautiful. It's a beautiful use of standard Italian, so of Tuscan. And what Collodi was trying to do with this book was to unite and to create Italians after unification of Italy. Because Collodi had, was very passionate about Italy's unification. He had uh, um, served as a volunteer in the two wars of independence. And then he had, uh, he had uh, through the pages of the newly born La Nazione, uh, really um, uh, very much promoted unification uh, through the annexation of, he was writing pro the annexation of Tuscany to the kingdom of Sardinia. Um, so this is to say how much, there's, there's a professor in the University of Florence, Professor Cipiani, who claims that had it not been for Collodi, uh, probably Tuscany wouldn't have uh, annex, uh, had its annexation to the kingdom of Sardinia. So um, Collodi was passionate about making Italians after Italy had been made. And uh, he wanted to do that by uh, teaching Italian standard Italian. He knew that uh, a, a population uh, will become a true population of a certain country only when the language is spoken by every person in that country. And he operated choices that would always go for the um, most, uh, the highest uh, possibility of readability for all parts of Italy. Um, and he, he comes out with this beautiful Tuscan, which is understandable by all Italians, but it's clearly Tuscan Italian. He was also uh, helping to compile the primo vocabolario della lingua toscana. Um, so he was, he was very, very passionate about, about uh, creating a language and creating an Italian population. And that's what he was trying to do. So I think that when we talk about uh, Italian uh, writers, we talk about Dante, we talk about Tasso, Manzoni, we should be talking about Collodi as well. Yeah, one of the things that struck me during this was that he had, he clashed repeatedly with the Academia de la Crusca, who wanted a much purer literary form. And he was all for putting in colloquial words from Florentine dialect, including in the adventures of Pinocchio, so that people would actually speak this language and not see it as something remote and just literary. Sorry. Yes. Yeah. Yes. No, I think that it, you know successive generations of Italians were drawn into the language by reading Le Aventure, undoubtedly. So he really played a hugely important role in Italy's post-unification unification, if you like. Yeah. He had written also very many uh, textbooks for children uh, that had been incredibly popular, incredibly popular. 17 reprints in, in the course of uh, not even 10 years, I think it is. I may be mistaken, but, but not so long. Um, his, his, book, his books for children were, were very, very successful. Yeah. Gee. I see. Is it written? Oh, 
I'd say 10, 11 years old, that's the age Pinocchio is pretty much. You can understand, yeah, by the class he's in. And also Pinocchio is an alter ego for Collodi himself. And uh, the, some things that Pinocchio does in school, Collodi uh, had written previously about having done them himself when he was about 10 or 11, when he was in school. I would give a slightly different answer and say 35, okay? because, and this is a point that we've discussed frequently, which is that the book reads in a completely different way if you are an adult, particularly an Italian adult. And, and that's, in fact, the, the beginning of this whole project that we did, because Anna was reading the book to her son, and when he was young and thinking, my God, this is not the book that I read when I was young. It's different. There's all these odd meanings and, the, and our annotations are all about the, these hidden meanings in the book. Yeah, yeah. The book is there, by the way, if anybody's interested. We didn't say so uh, earlier, so yeah. So the first part of the question was how how did we decide to do the uh, translation? Um, well, we wanted to write a book initially about about what Pinocchio re really talks about. So pretty much, you know, not everything, but uh, something similar to our talk. Uh, and Penguin Classics asked us to do a translation. Um, um, and we realized at that point that the translations that exist, even by important authors, are not faithful. They, 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 they're just, they just sound good and, and, you know, and they tell the same story, but they even change. I mean, you can tell when at times the, the, uh, the, the author has misunderstood what is happening. Now, mm. this, of course, not for all translations. Um, I have to say one wonderful translation uh, is uh, actually was uh, done by Maria Cristina Ancilotti's mother, who is sitting right here, Maria Cristina Ancilotti. Her mother did a wonderful translation. Um, Gloria Italiano, right? Yes, Gloria Italiano. She did a wonderful translation. Um, but the ones like the one for the New York, uh, uh, New York Times book review, it's, it's good in the target language, but it's not faithful. And I find that is such a betrayal of this incredibly good author, the Italian that Collodi uses and the plot. They're fantastic. And to read these translations, it's kind of like, well, what about poor, poor Carlo Lorenzini? <laughs> you know, so, so it was kind of like we were trying to rescue the, the text, the original text. It was difficult and, and it's impossible to give the same nuances that Tuscan language has. How can you, how can you translate into English yet instead of eh? You don't, you can't but you can give the kind of, uh, of, uh, of feeling that ye gives, right? So you're gonna to try to make it sound colloquial. And in fact, in, in we try to have Pinocchio speak colloquially uh, and the, the fairy a little with a higher register. Uh, we really tried hard to, to keep as much as possible, but of course, even our translation isn't the original, right? One of the other things that Penguin was able to give us that other translations do not have is this full 
annotation. So we didn't use it to try and explain our translation, except in a couple of instances, perhaps. What we tried to do was to explain what was underneath some of the metaphors that he uses. For example, there's a moment where Pinocchio comes to a city where all the birds are walking around. They're mostly birds, aren't they? Um, and they've lost all their feathers. And the city is Florence after unification because it was promised to be the capital. Vast investments were made in Florence by Florentines. They knocked down the walls of the old city to expand it. Um, and then uh, because of Mazzini, it was decided to take the capital off to Rome. And so everybody was left bankrupt. And that is something I think that gets lost in, on, on any English language reader, unless it's spelled out in the, in the annotations. Because the, the birds are spinati, they have no more feathers. Right. It's yeah. The, yeah. And he does that, by the way, a lot. That you talked about the use of language. One of the things that he does, that I've never seen any other author do, or read any other author who does it, is he gets his characters to, he doesn't use a, a well-known saying, he gets his actors, his, his characters, to act out that um, phrase. It's a quite extraordinary technique, and he was a very, very original author. On the business of structure that you talked about, I would say the keynote is, is, is it, um, improvisation, you know, genius improvisation, but improvisation, because it was originally published in installments in this um, children's newspaper. Probably he didn't quite know how he was going to end every chapter before he began. And, and then it stops, and then it begins again. And yet the amazing thing about it is that he sets up ideas right in the first two, three chapters that are then woven through the rest. So it's, it's quite a remarkable uh, achievement to have, to have done that. Yeah. One, one of these expressions that John is talking about, um, uh, Pinocchio is looking for food. And he, he, he looks into a pot that he thinks is a real pot. And instead, it's a painted pot. And he's surprised. Now, in Italian, and I don't know if it's Italian or Tuscan, actually, you say, rimanerci con un palmo di naso. Un palmo di naso. Pinocchio's nose grows of, for the length of four fingers is what, is what uh, Collodi writes, what Lorenzini writes. He says he looks into the pot and his nose grows for the length of four fingers. And what he's saying is, ci rimane con un palmo di naso. But he doesn't use but the phrase. But he doesn't use the phrase. Yeah. So that's one of the times in which Pinocchio's nose grows, and it's not because of telling a lie. And that happens more than once. It's, it's, it's beautiful. It's just beautiful. Any other thoughts or questions? Yes, the lady in the front. It's conveyed in our notes, but you can't really, I mean, people have to understand yeah. the book, if you like, yeah. and the notes are intended to help people understand that it's really not a book about lying. Yeah, yeah. Um, what, I, what I would like to uh, uh, add is that what we are saying can all be found in Collodi's uh, uh, journalistic uh, uh, articles, his political articles, and his satire. So uh, this, this um, is actually not an interpretation. It's we're, we're reusing what Collodi has said in his articles throughout his whole career, and then he sticks it in his various uh, pieces of, of literature. 
So, so it's actually, it's, it's not an interpretation. It's, it's, a, it's really his thought. That, that's why we are so passionate about wanting to, to reclaim <laughs> uh, the, the original story. Yeah. Kolodi's education yeah. is very interesting. Yeah. You go ahead. Okay, so, so I said he was, Pinocchio is an alter ego of Kolodi himself. Kolodi uh, had started to study in a seminary, seminary to, in order to become a priest. And the, uh, the, his parents were servants for the Ginori Lishi. Marchesi. And the Ginori Lisci paid for the education of both Carlo and his brother Paolo. Um, and Carlo was, when he applied himself, just like Pinocchio, he was really good in school, but he didn't always apply himself. And one day he decided, he, as a, I think, 16 year old, decided that he wasn't going to be a priest. And there's a story about him uh, uh, being a little teased by these children that are not children, other kids that were playing. He couldn't play because he was wearing uh, the, the, the tunica uh, to, to be a priest and uh, the gown to be a priest. And, uh, and they kept on teasing him, you can't play because you're wearing the gown. And he finally ripped his gown off and threw it on top of a tree. And he started playing and he went home for lunch and he declared, I'm not going to go back to school. So his uncle said, you're not going to quit school and I'm going to pay for your education. And he also said, I don't want the Marchese to pay for my education any longer because of family stories, um, family things that had happened. And uh, uh, he then goes and studies uh, at the Scolopi here in Florence. And he finishes the school, but his father dies, so he has he can't go to university, and he has because he has to work to maintain his help maintain his family, and uh, he stops right after the what would be today called Luceo. yeah. So, but he was he went to work in a lot in a in a bookshop, Libreria Piatti. And there he kept on studying, and he actually, when he was very young, got the permission to read the, the books that weren't allowed for everyone to read. So, so he, was, he was a very good, a very good scholar, but if, he didn't go to university. Sorry, John. Yeah. If he were in Florence today, he would probably be working with Icaro here from Paperback Exchange. <laughs> Okay. So I think at that point we can adjourn for some aperitivi. Excellent. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you.